Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome. What a privilege it is to be with all of you today and have this incredible opportunity to sit at the table with my new friend, Duane Reynolds. I'm Rachel Treviso, your official 2020 MetaRev RevCycle Partner Summit MC. While I also serve in my spare time as MetaRev's Vice President for Revenue Cycle Services, Dwayne Reynolds has an incredible presentation for us today, one that will challenge how you've thought and how we can think differently moving forward to truly be catalysts in creating a healthcare system equitably, not equally, equitably working for one and for all. Before I get too far ahead of myself, of course, we have a few housekeeping items to review. Number one, you are all on mute. That doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. However, please use our question and answer live stream on the right side of your screen to submit your questions throughout the first 60 minutes of Duane's presentation. This is what we'll use to build out the last 30 minutes, which is reserved specifically for our open Q&A with Duane. Number two, closed captioning is available. In the bottom of your Microsoft Teams live broadcast stream, you'll see a small CC box. Click to turn on and off. And finally, number three on our housekeeping list, we are recording this presentation. We'll share the link publicly with you and all those who have RSVP'd early next week. And now on to the good stuff. Get ready for an eye-opening, challenging, and of course fun 90-minute session with Mr. Duane Reynolds. Duane is the founder and CEO of Just Health Collective, a recognized change maker in healthcare and helping to lead the national conversation around diversity, inclusion, and health equity. He's committed his career to changing our healthcare system by creating a space where leaders recognize the relationship between health equity and value, and he's guided healthcare organizations of all sizes to create cultures of equality and of belonging. Duane has served as the president and CEO of the American Hospital Association's Institute for Diversity and Health Equity, along with holding operational leadership positions at Johns Hopkins Medicine, Emory Healthcare, Ohio Health, and Optum, a United Health Group company. He's also an alum of the advisory board company where he served as their healthcare consulting director and where he launched the division's first inclusion and diversity department and led as the inaugural chief executive. <laughs> Very impressive. What an honor it is for me to introduce to you all Duane Reynolds. Thank you so much, Rachel. I am excited to be here with you all today. It's a great honor for me to uh, be invited uh, to speak on a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. And so what I'd like to do is actually start with a moment of silence and reflection. So for the next few minutes, I ask for your undivided attention. It's important to acknowledge the catalyst events that have led us to where we are today. Behind all of this, we must recognize three individuals who have forever altered our culture and country's trajectory. These people paid the ultimate price, along with so many others who've lost their lives as a result of racial injustice. Now I want you to follow my directions for a short activity. First, I'd like you to close your eyes and breathe in slowly for five counts, then hold your breath. Now breathe out slowly until you exhaust all of your breath. This was your metaphysical connection to the souls of three humans. It also represented who we were before and after their lives were taken. It's time to awaken to a new reality, a rebirth of our shared humanity, of equity, and of justice.
we're living in a historic moment. One that feels like in some ways that it was done to us, but in fact, it's one that we created by intention. The United States is a nation of two realities. For many in this generation, this is a first glance of what we've done a Herculean job of covering, hiding, and pretending that we lived in a post-racial world. I'd like to level set by explaining a few terms and concepts that'll help us better understand racism, bias, and privilege. Racism is conscious prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism that is directed at a person or group of people from a particular racial or ethnic community. In contrast, implicit bias is unconscious, and it's about social stereotypes that operate outside of our own conscious awareness. Unconscious bias is a neurological function, and it exists because we have a need to interpret information very quickly to make decisions. Implicit bias is really far more prevalent than conscious prejudice, and it's often incompatible with our own conscious values. So let's start by defining three terms that are critical to understanding this spectrum of racism. But first, let me point out that whether you are racist, non-racist, or anti-racist, you concurrently have unconscious bias. In addition, there is fluidity in this model. None of us are born racist, and this gives us the power to grow and change. The innermost circle represents racism, defined as having both racial prejudice and power. In our society, power is defined by wealth, position, education, and other status indicators that society overvalues in dominant groups. As a result, dominant groups maintain the authority uh, to enact policy, control institutions, circulate wealth, and maintain privilege. The next layer is non-racism, which is defined as passive rejection, opposition, and disassociation from behaviors actions and ideologies considered to be racist. Most people on this call would likely fall into this category, and it reflects the sentiment, I don't see color. While on the surface this sounds positive, it actually devalues people of color by not recognizing that their color reflects their lived experience. We want you to see color. We just don't want to be judged and treated unfairly because of our color. The outer circle, or anti-racism, is the desired destination. In order to achieve a just and equitable society, you have to become anti-racist and engage in the practice of identifying, challenging, and changing values, structures, and behaviors that prop up and perpetuate systemic racism and oppression. Professor Ibram X. Kendi, who's the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, outlined six action steps to becoming anti-racist. First, you must understand the definition of the term racist, which we discussed in the previous slide. Next, you have to stop saying, I'm not racist. It's not enough to say that you're not racist, and it's often really a self-serving sentiment. Kendi states, by reflexively defining yourself as not racist or beyond racism's firm grip, you're making it impossible to see how your own ideas, thoughts, and actions could indeed be racist. Not racist is often just a defense mechanism. And to truly be anti-racist means actually embracing and articulating non-racist beliefs. Third, you must identify racial inequities and disparities. Being anti-racist means taking time to learn about identifying these inequities and disparities that give white people material advantages over people of color. Anti-racists understand that there are clear policies across numerous sectors in our public and private lives that put racial groups at a disadvantage. Fourth, 
you need to confront the racist ideas that you've held or continue to hold. This requires that you examine whether your own views or beliefs have justified racial inequality. You don't want to remain ignorant to these views or decline to advocate for policies that produce disparities because of your discomfort. The best way to understand is to listen to racial justice advocates, activists, and those with lived experience that have discussed anti-racist positions and policies. Next, you should understand that anti-racism needs to be intersectional. Race intersects with multiple aspects of people's identities, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, all overlap with race. Therefore, it's important to take an intersectional approach when being anti-racist because those with these intersections actually have further challenges that they face when seeking equality and equity. Finally, you must champion anti-racist ideas and policies. This means committing to action with the intent to change racist policies. You have to support organizations in your community that are fighting for policies that create um, racial equity. Use your position of power to change racist policies in the settings where they may exist. Privilege is systemically conferred advantages that individuals enjoy by virtue of their membership in dominant groups. Uh, these dominant groups give them access to resources and institutional power that are beyond the common advantage of marginalized citizens. Notice I didn't say white privilege. This is because white privilege is only one form of privilege. As Americans, we have privilege. As people sitting behind these computers, as people who serve in public roles, you have privilege. But white privilege is critical to understanding and deconstructing systemic racism, which is why it requires our attention and focus. Social justice means that everyone in society experiences justice as a result of resources and opportunity being distributed equitably. Social justice requires equity, allies who take on issues as their own, leaders who drive change at a structural level, institutional level, and individual level. Marginalized groups will continue to be disadvantaged and oppressed without social justice. We treat all people the same and do not consider any differences as we treat them. Our culture is blind to race, gender, etc. Oftentimes, this is the sentiment of people who may consider themselves non racist. But color blindness and treating everyone the same is really not the solution. While on the surface it may sound positive, it actually devalues people of color by not recognizing that their color reflects their lived experience. As the image demonstrates, equality is treating everyone the same, whereas equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful. Equality assumes that we will benefit from the same support. In the second image, people are given different supports depending on their needs. They're being treated equitably. A year ago, I would have told you that equity was the end goal, but the reality is that we all don't start at the same place. Achieving true justice is about liberation. The act of freeing someone or something from another's control. In the third image, all three people can see the game without any supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequality was addressed. The healthcare field is a microcosm of our society, a society that was intentionally built based on the premise of white supremacy. While we've made strides, we've never fully addressed the historical ills of our country, 
simply hoping that years of conditioned experience would somehow remediate itself without open and honest dialogue. Our current state of affairs is evidence that we have much work to do. Reducing racial health care disparity requires acknowledging that the effects of structural racism also impact health status and then working towards sweeping transformative change in our institutions and society as a whole. Nearly half of American cities are now majority non-white and the demographics throughout the nation continue to change. And this is really requiring a fundamental reframing of the patient, consumer, and employee experience within healthcare organizations. These changes occur as gender, racial, ethnic, and cultural inequities, including in health outcomes, remain a reality for far too many, costing us billions of dollars and thousands of lives each year. The fundamental question I like to pose is what amount of disparity is okay for the patients that you treat? Data released by CMS recently found that there were notable racial disparities in coronavirus cases and hospitalizations among Medicare beneficiaries. According to the analysis, Black and Hispanic beneficiaries were more likely to be diagnosed with coronavirus infections and hospitalized when compared with white beneficiaries um, of other ethnicities. Black beneficiaries who were diagnosed with the new coronavirus were about four times more likely than white beneficiaries to be hospitalized. In addition, in two separate analyses, it suggests that areas where the majority of the residents are people of color are less likely than predominantly white areas to have testing sites for the coronavirus. In one analysis, researchers, researchers found that in zip codes where the population was 75% white on average, have one coronavirus testing site per 14,500 individuals, whereas areas where the population is 75% black on average had one testing site per 23,300 individuals. So the evidence is really well documented. Disparities plague our healthcare system with regard to receipt of evidence-based care, timeliness of care, access and access to care based off of race. The Trump administration recently rolled back protections for the LGBTQ plus population that were delineated in the Affordable Care Act, despite this community suffering experiences, quite frankly, that I wouldn't have thought possible in healthcare, including blatant refusal of service, refusal to touch a patient, and abusive language. The unfortunate part is that most hospitals are not collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data. So how do we fix a problem for which we aren't collecting the appropriate data? And out of curiosity, how often have you as provider organizations or you as a revenue cycle company ever broken out your data by different demographics to really understand the experience of those different populations. Health equity quite simply impacts all elements of a hospital's priorities. And the reality is we simply cannot afford not to address health inequity because it impacts our business in ways that may not always be obvious. As mentioned earlier, the direct annual cost of disparities is estimated to, to be 57.5 billion on an annual basis. If not addressed, this problem will only be exacerbated as the demographics of the country steadily march towards the US as a majority minority country. So I'd like to shift gears a bit. I want you to understand some fundamentals. Insurance does not equal access. Access does not equal appropriate utilization. 
utilization does not guarantee good quality. And high quality does not automatically yield healthcare equity. And healthcare equity is not the same as health equity. So let me further explain that. Healthcare equity relates to differences in insurance status, access to, and the administration of health services, while health equity is an outcome. And that's outcome is based on an individual's opportunity to attain their highest level of health. So how do we achieve health equity? We value people equally and deliver opportunity equitably. This means we have to optimize the conditions in which people are born, grow, age, live, work, and learn. We have to work inside of our organizations by collecting and utilizing disparities data. We must mitigate unconscious bias. We must diversify our leadership teams and drive accountability for creating inclusive environments. It also behooves us to begin to work constructively with other sectors. We do this because we have to address factors that influence health, including employment, housing, transportation, education, public safety, and food access. These are also known as the social determinants of health. We must name and fix systemic racism as a force in determining how those social determinants of health came to be distributed in this, in this country. Finally, we must acknowledge the interdependence between healthcare equity and health equity to build an ecosystem of change, which can and should be led by healthcare organizations, systems and anchor institutions within the community. Now I'd like to share a brief video that helps define systemic racism and how it impacts all sectors of our society. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor neighborhood. He has a friend named Kevin who lives in a wealthy neighborhood. All of Jamal's neighbors are African-American and all of Kevin's neighbors are white. Because Jamal's school district is mostly funded by property taxes, his school is not very well funded. His classrooms are overcrowded, his teachers are underpaid, and he doesn't have access to high quality tutors or extracurricular activities. Kevin's school district is also funded by property taxes, so his school is very well funded. His classrooms are never crowded, his teachers are very well paid, and he has access to high quality tutors and lots of extracurricular activities. Kevin and Jamal live only a few streets away from each other. So how come they're growing up in such different worlds with such different opportunities for success? The answer has to do with America's history of systemic racism. To understand it better, let's look at what life was like for Kevin and Jamal's grandparents. Decades after the Civil War, many government agencies started to draw maps dividing cities into sections that were either desirable or undesirable for investment. This practice was called redlining, and it usually blocked off entire black neighborhoods from access to private and public investment. Banks and insurance companies used these maps for decades to deny black people loans and other services based purely on race. Historically speaking, Owning a home and getting a college education is the easiest way for an American family to build wealth. But when Jamal's grandparents wanted to buy a house, the banks refused because they lived in a neighborhood that was redlined. So Jamal's grandparents were not able to buy a home, and because colleges could prevent them from attending through legal segregation, their options for higher education were really scarce. Kevin's grandparents, on the other hand, got a low interest loan to buy their first house and got accepted into a handful of top universities, which traditionally only accepted white students. This opened up a wealth of opportunities that they were able to pass on to their kids and grandkids. Even as late as the 1980s, an investigation into the Atlanta real estate market showed that banks were more willing to lend to low-income white families than to middle or upper-income African-American families. As a result, today, for every $100 of wealth held by a white family, black families have $5.04. A 2017 study confirms that redlining is still affecting home values in major cities like Chicago today. 
This explains how Kevin and Jamal inherited vastly different circumstances. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. A big part of systemic racism is implicit bias. These are prejudices in society that people are not aware that they have. Let's go back to Kevin and Jamal. Against all odds, Jamal manages to be the only student from his high school to get accepted into a great university, the same one that Kevin and his high school friends are attending. But after Kevin and Jamal both graduate, Jamal notices that his resume isn't drawing as much interest as Kevin's, even though they graduated from the same program with the exact same GPA. Unfortunately for Jamal, studies show that resumes with white sounding names get twice as many callbacks as identical resumes with black sounding names. Implicit bias is one of the reasons why the black unemployment rate is twice the rate of white unemployment, even among college graduates today. You can see evidence of systemic racism in every area of life. The disparities in family wealth, incarceration rates, political representation, and education are all examples of systemic racism. Unfortunately, the biggest challenge with systemic racism is that there's no single person or entity responsible for it, which makes it very hard to solve. So what can you do? The first thing you can do is work towards becoming more aware of your own implicit biases. What are some prejudices that you might hold that you're not aware of? Second, let's acknowledge that the consequences of slavery and Jim Crow laws are still affecting access to opportunity today. As a result, we should support systemic changes that create more equal opportunities for everyone. Increasing public school funding and making it independent from property taxes would be a great start so that poor and wealthy districts can receive equal access to resources. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Luckily, we're all part of the system, which means that we all have a role to play in making it better. Peace. The diagram that you're looking at now is known as the lens of systemic oppression. Racism occurs at both an individual and systemic level. So in order to deconstruct systemic racism, we must work at an individual or person level, the institution or organizational level, and at the structural level, which deals with institutions, laws, policies, and the history of our country. At an institution or hospital level, we have to elevate disparate impact of policies, procedures, and processes and begin to deconstruct and dismantle those particular elements that continue to sort of prop up systemic racism. For instance, procedures that limit access for Medicaid patients is an example of an institutional issue that has impact on vulnerable populations. As we continue to move towards value-based care, there's greater incentive to address population health. Population health means we must also address the upstream factors, which are the issues and the root cause of some of our health disparities. Hence, we have the need for organizations and individuals to begin deconstructing at a structural and individual level. So I wanna thank you for attending today's presentation. Consider this a start on your journey. A lot of where we are requires deep self-reflection and introspective learning that only you can choose to do in order to make our society, our healthcare organizations, and those organizations that support our healthcare ecosystem more just and equitable. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Rachel, and I think we're going to have some time for Q&A. Hello. All right, thank you, Duane. We certainly do have some questions. I'll get started um, with the first one, but Duane, you're still on camera, so I'd love to just have a thumbs up. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Okay, wonderful. I'll start with this question, Duane. You spoke about the difference between equality and equity and liberation and acknowledged that at one point, perhaps even recently, you thought that equality or equity would be the, the place for us to drive to, but now you understand it's in fact liberation. But mm -hmm. that does feel a little overwhelming when we're still grappling with 
the difference or the comprehension between equality and equity, how do we begin to even think about how we liberate ourselves and our communities and our organizations? So perhaps that's a very broad question, but that in particular was something that um, I'd love to hear you talk more about. Sure, um, and uh, admittedly, all of this is overwhelming, particularly when our country is coming to an awareness of things that I think we thought we were past. Um, and so, as you saw in the video, there are many components to this picture. I always believe the first place to start is within yourself. So as you learn and become more educated, you will begin to see the, the issues that plague our society, uh, where racism shows up, where unconscious bias shows up. Getting yourself educated is the first step. Then as you play roles with inside of your organizations, um, I think it behooves you to advocate and become an ally for inclusive spaces um, that will allow people to flourish and be who they are. Um, it also behooves you if you have children to educate them on what our history is and acknowledge it for what it has been with an understanding that we're trying to create a different world for them. Um, so taking those small steps that you can impact, um, I think are, are critical parts to beginning the process. As we get further down the journey, particularly those of us in leadership positions within organizations have to begin to think about one, how we deconstruct policies, procedures, um, practices within our own institutions that may create inequity. For instance, analyzing pay inequity between men and women or pay uh, gap between the highest paid person organization and the lowest paid person in the organization and really making determinations as to what is fair. Um, I think as you again work within the institution, then you have to connect outside of the institution. Healthcare organizations simply can't solve these problems by themselves. Um, we have work to do inside of our organization, but to really think about our impact on communities, we have to partner with other organizations, particularly community based organizations that understand uh, and have perhaps deeper connections with um, the, the lived experience of patients and consumers in a particular area. And if we can then partner with them to create things like affordable housing units uh, in particular areas where we are trying to diversify or um, <clears throat> opportunities to uh, go into higher paying jobs that allow um, the economic stability of uh, a community to flourish. If we are lifting the tide, we're lifting all boats. Um, so it becomes really critical to form those partnerships because without them, we're working in these silos to break apart something that is so entrenched across just about everything that we do uh, in this country. Thank you, Duane. Lots of incredible insights in there. So I'd like to take that and then pivot to a question that's more specific and more tactical. We have an audience member who has said, Duane, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. What's your recommendation for the very first most tactical thing that we as organizations can do to develop our journey towards health equity? Um, that's a great question. And I think the very first thing is something like we're doing today. Um, bring some awareness of the issue to your audience. Um, but I will actually back up a few slides here because um, the way that my organization, Just Health Collective, um, views this is by looking at a lens of belonging. So belonging being the intersection of diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, we encourage organizations to think of this holistically as they consider transformation. And 
the things that uh, you need to be looking at are really at a strategic level. So it's it's not enough to just do training. We've been doing diversity and inclusion training for many, many years. Training is great for aware awareness. It doesn't always bring behavioral impact and it may not impact a policy that uh, is causing inequity within your organization. So we believe that the, the, the most critical thing is that you begin to look at this at a strategic level. And what I mean by that is understanding how belonging fits into your vision and strategy, whether or not you have the structure and leadership that is appropriate to move the organization forward um, when you have figured out that vision and strategy. The next step is really about getting to those tactical organizational capabilities. So looking through, and actually I'm going to move to the next slide here, but looking through things like HR, understanding the performance management process, the onboarding process, looking at legal and risk and compliance to understand if you have any trends um, that are happening in your organization, making an intentional focus on um, investing in minority and women owned businesses to be your suppliers. Um, when we start to get into the health equity space, it's really about first collecting the right type of data at a baseline. You should be collecting race, ethnicity and language data and sexual orientation and gender identity data that gives you the ability to then do performance improvement um, once you identify those disparities. The other thing that a lot of healthcare organizations are doing right now is focusing on a social determinants of health strategy. Social determinants of health um, exist in communities. What patients really show up to your door with are social needs. So for instance, um, food insecurity is a social need that a patient may show up to your door with. Economic insecurity, not able to pay their bills is something that they will show up to your door with. So how do you as the healthcare organization begin to partner with community-based organizations to help alleviate some of those social needs? And finally, weaving this into quality and safety is critical. Um, I've always been perplexed as to how organizations can claim such great quality, but not really understand the disparate impact that may be happening within various demographics. It would be like taking a look at an income statement and making assumptions just by the, the top line look at that and not really diving down into key drivers of why revenue or expenses a certain way. Um, so that was probably a long winded answer to a short question, but first, yes, do some training, bring some awareness, um, but then you've got to really think about this strategically. Wonderful. Thank you, Duane. You touched on HR in that response, so I think this next question will come at a good timing. This audience member says, begin with yourself. I love that. Where do you believe, Duane, in a healthcare organization does DEI begin? Should it be its own department? Should it be in HR or where does it belong structurally? Um, that is a great question and actually I'm working on a thought leadership piece around that now because uh, today it fits in so many different places, right? Um, it's in HR, sometimes I see it in operation, Sometimes I see it in social responsibility. Sometimes it may fall in community uh, health and impact. I think the critical thing here is understanding that there are basic functions that a leader in this type of role should be responsible for. And those functions go back to belonging, equity, diversity, inclusion. So what I think would be appropriate is identifying a leader, be that a chief health equity and inclusion officer or your chief community health officer or chief diversity officer, but making them responsible for both the internal aspects. So 
what your employee culture looks like and also responsible for how you begin to situate your organization to better serve your patients and consumers. And I intentionally say consumers because how you situate yourself in this area um, reflects whether or not consumers will choose to come to you um, in the future. And so I think it's just very critical to have data be a data analytics be a part of that strategy. Um, internal employee culture, looking at equity, looking at unconscious bias, cultural competency, then turning your work to health equity and disparities analysis in your operational units. And so the type of leader in this situation um, is really a very multifaceted person who understands both organizational operations, employee human behavior and culture, um, and then also understands the external sort of community relations and development piece. Hopefully that helps explain a bit. Thank you. Next question. This also comes from an audience member. I was particularly struck by your comment about seeing color because color reflects lived experiences. Do you think asking people to share their experiences is a good step? If so, how do we do that? Um, that is the absolute right step. Um, and I'll tell you part of, particularly when we're talking about African Americans and racism, part of what we have to do is create a safe space for those experiences to be shared. Because oftentimes, and I'll speak for myself as an African American, I showed up to the workplace covering, making sure that I could create psychological safety for myself and sort of assimilate it to the predominant culture. Um, and so those lived experiences, we, we don't always get the opportunity to express that. And what I can tell you, particularly for your African American employees, is that each time we have one of these incidents, um, it triggers emotional trauma for us. And yet we have to show up to work each day and pretend as though we're not damaged by that. So having conversations around lived experience is critical. Um, within Just Health Collective, we actually have a, a product called Intersections Dialogues, and it's where we invite small groups um, to have that type of dialogue around three questions that really open up the group to share their experiences. And I apologize, I have a dog barking in the background. Um, that opens up that lived experience so that people can begin to learn and process and understand each other's stories. So that is a very, very critical point. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. No apologies needed. We're all living in the world of COVID. So dogs barking in the background are the new normal. <laughs> all right, next question, Dwayne. This one's a tough one, I think. I'm afraid that the national attention to this issue is a popular fad in media and advertising. What are your thoughts on media and advertising's role in equity, especially in the current environment? Yeah, um, I have that same concern. Um, but part of me, I guess the optimistic part of me is that movements like this uh, typically occur with younger generations. And as we've seen on the streets during protests, this is not just African-American people carrying the torch uh, as per usual. This is allies of all different um, races, ethnicities, colors coming to the table to say enough is enough. And that's being led by younger generations. So that that's my optimism. The media's role, um, it's a double-edged sword. Um, part of the reason we have these stereotypes about um, different groups is as a result of what is perpetuated in the media. On the same hand, um, media can also change culture. So um, I guess the example I'll use is think about Will and Grace and the time that that sitcom came out. It was still pretty taboo to be living openly gay, but that show actually 
was a trailblazer in terms of uh, normalizing the life of LGBT folks. Wonderful. Next question. There's a couple of questions around this same theme. So okay. um, Mr. Rogers has encouraged us, look for the helpers. The, the topic today and the conversation that we're having is tough, but I think that we're hopeful that there's someone out there, some organization, some community who is doing that, who's being an ally and who's doing this right. What are those examples? Who are those organizations or those, those communities who are really making progress down their journey? Um, they are out there. And in terms of communities, I, I'm thinking of a community that's down in Florida and I don't remember the exact name of that community, but there is, um, there are communities that are, again, doing these collaborative efforts and trying to understand some of the laws that have been put in place that continue to prop up systemic oppression. Um, from a healthcare organization perspective, I can uh, rattle off uh, a few that are doing this right. Um, so Northwell Health um, in the New York, New Jersey uh, area um, has been on this journey and commitment for quite some time and they have both a person that focuses on the internal diversity and inclusion efforts and a chief health equity officer and a chief um, social responsibility officer. So the three of those positions really work to cross collaborate on the very things we've talked about today. Um, I think it one behooves organizations to put in the right structure and leadership. It has to be elevated to a strategy level. If you don't, then it is simply one more training that doesn't necessarily accomplish what, what you need it to do. Um, another organization that is doing great work is Novant Health. So the person that leads their equity and inclusion efforts was a former hospital president. That hospital president now sits at the system level. Um, she knows organ the organization and how it runs. So part of solving health care disparities is understanding um, the points of friction that occur when a patient moves through the process. And she's been able to effectively influence change inside of that organization. Um, the last organization I'll mention, because they are new to this journey, but they are making uh, a very pronounced statement about what they're going to do, and that's Intermountain Healthcare. And you can actually uh, go to their website. They have um, they have decided on five priorities that they will be focusing on um, to move the needle forward. One is hiring the right type of people. Both they're hiring both a health equity officer, but then some clinical leaders, both on the physician and other clinician side, to lead the healthcare disparities efforts. Um, in addition, they're making investments in their community. Um, they're making investments in developing more diverse talent through the pipeline. Um, and so they're looking holistically, not just at the internal things, but how do they serve as an anchor institution for their community. Thank you for sharing that list. I believe I have now what might be a softball question for you, Dwayne. Okay. Somebody in the audience wants to know what kind of dog you have. <laughs> OK, yeah, that, that's that's a great question. I have three. Um, two of them are Bichons, and they're probably about 12 to 15 pounds. And then my third one is a Doberman Pinscher. Um, and you'd be surprised, but the Bichons uh, rule the roost. Um, they keep the Doberman in line. Thanks for that question. <laughs> Absolutely. Now a comment that I'd like you to respond to. One of the audience members says, this is just a comment, but the word incident is a nice way of naming the atrocities that black and brown people experience. Naming is critical. And words are important. So yep. how do you feel about that comment? I understand completely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is the killing, the murdering of black people that is systemic in our country. Yeah, um, 
thank you for that call out. Um, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Next question. Many of us work on the back end of the patient experience and we're not face to face with the patients. Aside from changes in our home and personal lives and our outlooks, are there other ways that you can see as part of our business and revenue cycle that we can impact some of this change? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So inside of your organization, absolutely. But we're actually working with organizations now to do um, product analysis from a health equity, diversity, and inclusion lens. So understanding you know, the products that you have and whether or not they are conducive to uh, diverse demographics that may have certain challenges that, for instance, don't allow them to uh, properly move through, uh, let's say, your website to make a payment, right? If, you, if it's not interpreted um, or translated in the right type of uh, language for that patient to effectively make a payment, we've created a barrier where a barrier didn't have to be, and it's actually impacting our revenue. Um, I think in the revenue cycle experience, um, we know that we are we have opportunities to connect patients who may have challenge with payment to resources um, that sort of go beyond just the here's a resource to pay your bill, but what other things might that person actually benefit from that perhaps we as the healthcare organization, as the administrative side, can actually point them towards. I think we sort of have to think outside of the traditional box we've been in. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, Dwayne. Your information is very informative and enlightening. Are you aware of any advocate groups that are working in other industries, such as banking or loan organizations, or in local governments to rid communities of practices like redlining? There's more. Is there any awareness and call to action there that we are discussing for healthcare? If so, are you involved with them so that the discussion is more whole within communities and not leaving the burden to healthcare institutions to mm -hmm. initiate lasting change? Yes, um, so Color of Change is a great organization that is really advocating for anti-racism and advocating for policy change uh, at federal level. Um, so I think that's a good organization to, to be involved with. Um, Robert Wood Johnson has a initiative called Culture of Health. And the Culture of Health is actually very focused on bringing multi-sector uh, players together to help look at this more holistically. Um, and I think if you have an opportunity to go to their website and read about culture of health, um, it really is focused on improving health equity, um, knowing that, again, healthcare organizations can't do it alone. Um, it is very much a lift that needs to be done by multiple industries, multiple sectors, but there are many, many types of organizations that are out there um, that one could join and participate in. Um, part of what uh, I'm trying to do within um, our community, we actually have a digital uh, engagement community called the Just Health Collective Village. We're trying to bring in multi-sector individuals to interact within that community. Um, we do different types of learning events and discussions, et cetera, but really trying to think about how we bring those sectors and multi-sectors together. Thank you, Duane. Another audience member asks, asks this. I'm hearing both internal and external needs here to ensure that the say, do gap doesn't happen. We need to start internally, right? But as you work on that, what are you also saying externally to ensure that we're saying something and we're not just being mute on topics that matter so much in our society? Yes, yeah, so I think you can do things concurrently um, depending on the structures that you have. If you have foundations that are part of your 
uh, organization or set aside of your organization? What is your foundation doing to invest in the community in a strategic way? We know that healthcare organizations um, that are nonprofit also must do co community benefit. Um, one of the things that tends to happen is that the community benefit becomes about where you're creating a mobile clinic or where you might have given money to this particular organization. Um, but it doesn't necessarily always um, connect to the community needs uh, of of the zip codes that you're serving. So from a public health perspective, there's community needs assessments. How does your community benefit program connect there to be able um, to really impact those external um, external activities that you you should be doing concurrently. Um, so I, I don't know if I fully answered that question, but um, yes to the to the internal, yes to the external, and you can do it concurrently. Wonderful. This next question includes an acronym, which maybe you can also help to inform the audience on. ERGs, what are your thoughts? Have you seen them effectively help organizations internally for patients, similar similar types of support, black breastfeeding mothers, etc.? Um, yes, I love ERGs. It stands for Employee Resource Groups. Um, so ERGs are sort of the evolution of what was known as affinity groups. So groups of employees that came together initially around social interaction, uh, creation of safe space, ability to to um, just build trusting relationships when you're sort of in the minority of organizations. The evolution of that has actually been employee resource groups that provide um, resources for the employees to sort of flourish uh, in their, for instance, uh, development uh, around you know, moving from a uh, frontline position or independent contributor into leadership. Um, it also still serves a social function, but where I see this um, most impact impactful is when you make the move from employee resource groups to business resource groups. And what I mean by that is it still retains um, the affinity, if you will, but it, it begins to to be more connected strategically to where the organization is trying to go. So utilizing these employer business resource groups to inform product, to inform strategy, to analyze your benefits, to make sure that they're equitable, um, becomes a really great uh, business lever that you can use. And it actually engages your employees that much more. And what you'll often find is that um, employees that are of diverse demographics will will tend to gravitate to those organizations and usually those employees are doing this on their own volition on their own time they're probably high performing individuals and it makes for a great feeder pipeline into leadership as you're looking to diversify your organization All right, well, that concludes the questions that we have, Duane. So I believe that we've neared the end of our time together. First and most importantly, thank you, Duane, for your insightful presentation. I personally learned so much, and I know that I need to walk away and wrestle with those learnings a little bit. For everyone on the phone, please know that Duane's door or his virtual door is open to all of you. So please don't hesitate to reach out and start a conversation with him directly. Secondly, thank you to all of you on the call. We value our partnership with you so much and we're truly privileged to sit at any table with you, this table especially. So on behalf of all of MetaRev, thank you for your continued partnership. It's a joy to work with you and to learn alongside you, especially at events and on topics and conversations such as this. Lastly, early next week, you'll receive both a link to this recording, which you're welcome to share with anyone that you choose, and a link to a short survey. We'd love to hear your feedback on your experience today and also give you space to share ideas 
for future conversations that we can have together or future RevCycle summits. I hope you each enjoy the rest of your day. Channel your inner catalyst for change because change is possible and it truly begins with you and begins with me. Cheers, everybody. Thank you all so much. Thank you.